also uh, Professor Un Anfi Yenko and, uh, and is continued to now, that is a uh, NATO brand science for peace, uh, which aimed uh, the uh, preparation of sophisticated shape nickel catalysts for better um, uh, heat and mass transfer in steam methane reform. And we performed only part of this project which was associated with uh, research on new catalyst formulation of steam methane reform. Our part of the work within this brand started in 2000 and was finished, was over in early 2002. And this research was continued in some fundamental way uh, by grant for young scientists of Siberian branch of Russian Academy of Science. So, and uh, all the uh, topic here, I would like to call this SMSI strong metal support reaction in the nickel containing fuel silicate system, uh, so clay system. And the aim was finding the stable catalysts for the steam within the form. Aim information of some new catalytic formula for steam within the form at that should have, uh, which that should have really good rheological properties for being able to make some really sophisticated shape. I will show you later what shape was designed during this pro 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 project Not by our team by our collaborators. Uh, we needed also to have high activity in steam reform, real inertness in the code formation processes, and again, good rheological properties. Uh, putting all this together, we decided that it, is, it would be quite reasonable to look for the solution for, for new catalyst formulation in clay materials, because first of all, they have really good rheological properties. And also, there were some publications in literature, uh, namely of Clef Pouzon from, um, from um, France, uh, that uh, reported that nickel containing catalysts supported by uh, natural silicates uh, have lower cold formation, and they suppose that it is due to uh, interaction of nickel particles with silicon containing support. However, if we deal with silicon containing support, we should keep in mind that for steam methane reforming, uh, this French group aimed um, dry methane reform, so less water content. But for steam methane reforming, the absence, absolute absence of silica oxide uh, should be very, very important because silica is reactive in the uh, reaction conditions of steam methane reforming temperature of above 1000 K pressure of water above 10 bars and it reacts with water vapors and give some volatile uh, silicon compound which is supposed to be something like COH4 despite we um, failed to find any uh, experimental proof of real structure of this volatile compound. However, anyway, silicon can be removed from the reactor and then condensed in uh, condensers and cooling equipment uh, and of course in these cold zones the heat exchangers are absolutely out of order after condensing this silicon oxide in this cold zone. Therefore we needed to look not only for active catalysts but only also for very stable silicon containing system uh, which should not contain silica nor, nor before, neither before the reaction nor after the reaction. So the answer, we tried to search in fewer alumina silicates of nickel magnesium aluminum. So we tried to stabilize <coughs> nickel silica or silicate, silicon in nickel silicate or magnesium silicate structure by introducing aluminum cations. Here there is a list of some most important studies which were performed during this project. There is first of all studies of evaluation of phase composition in argon and hydrogen treatment by XRD, FTIR, and DTA, DDG, thermogrammetry. Absence of CO2 was proved by FTIR, but however, it is not very sensitive method. We have found that it is possible much better and much more sensitive to use XPS for uh, proving 
absence of silica in the sample. Also, stability of in the reaction mixture, so absence silica after uh, treating the catalyst in the reaction mixture at 650 degrees C at 20 bar, was proved by the same techniques. Nickel zero structure after reductive treatments were studied by thermal desorption of hydrogen, absorption of oxygen from N2O, XRD, XPS, and high resolution electron microscopy studies. Also, we studied activity in steam methane reforming in the circulated radiate less reactor at uh, some range of temperatures at one bar and high uh, water to steam to gas ratio 2 to 1. Activity in carbon formation was studied from starting from methane, so in methane decomposition, and from CO, so the CO disproportionation. I would like first to give you some um, illustration of what could be a nickel silicon containing catalyst, uh, starting from nickel silicate of laser dioxide group, so it is liquid. Uh, this silicate uh, represent itself layered structure, and each layer consists of uh, tetrahedron uh, layer and oxygen or octahedral layer. Tetrahedrons contain inside silicon fourfold coordinated with oxygen atoms. And oxy uh, octahedral side contains bivalent metal, here it is nickel, coordinated by four OH groups and two oxygen atoms. So this is well-studied structure which, is, which was widely studied by different groups, uh, by Bernard uh, Delmont group, by Michel Schiff, uh, and also by Catherine Louis, who uh, had her report here last Friday. And that is evolution of two silicate of nickel nucleid, uh, nickel nucleid. Uh, in argon medium, in the nucleic medium, in during the reduction. We can see that FTIR spectrum of nucleoid is really very uh, remarkable because there is some splitting in CO uh, vibrations uh, characteristic for um, uh, silicon in tetrahedral coordination with oxygen. And uh, uh, you can see that the splitting absolutely disappears at that as the splitting when the, the, the sample is treated in argon flow at approximately 500 degrees C. That corresponds to the appearance of uh, nickel silicate with TOT structure. So we have tetrahedral layer of silicon, octahedral layer with divinant metals, and again tetrahedral layer of silicon, so TOT, so-called uh, three octahedral, uh, three octahedral um, layered silicates of steel side subgroup. And so nickel oxide also is released during this process. And during the reduction, nickel oxide is reduced, but also is reduced nickel from silicate structure at approximately 540 degrees C. You can see that you can uh, see here uh, the huge shoulder of, one, of one, 1,200 reciprocal centimeters. And now this spectrum uh, corresponds to nickel, uh, uh, to silica, and uh, metallic nickel. A nickel loading in this system was proved to be 60% weight by uh, titration by oxygen, uh, and less than 40% is silica. Diameter of nickel is only 8 nanometers, so the surface of zero nickel, nickel zero is 65 square meter per gram, and it looks like it is very good, highly dispersed catalyst, uh, nickel containing catalyst. However, this catalyst is absolutely not suitable for steam methane reforming because we have a lot of silica in this catalyst and it shouldn't be stable in the reaction conditions. What if we introduce aluminum into this sample? Uh, first of all, we'd like to say about a little bit about preparation of this sample. We found it impossible to prepare the sample by the same technique as was used for liquid preparation. Uh, for liquid, we used just deposition by precipitation of nickel salts by urea decomposition um, over silica support. Here, it was, we had found that it was impossible to prepare this structure by this method, so we used first silica aluminum, uh, silicon aluminum 
oxide gel formation. After that, we introduced nickel salt and we um, treated the mixture in uh, uh, the hydro, uh, hy um, hydrothermal conditions, so at approximately 200 degrees C and approximately 100 bar. And after that, we received this structure. And obtained this structure, which uh, obviously looked like a uh, rather uniform and one phase uh, sample. So, for this structure, aluminum substitutes both silicon and divalent metal, and the extent of substitution, so amount of aluminum cations in tetracontents or hydrogens, should be the same to keep the charge uh, equal to zero. And from all other points, the structure is very similar to what we have for, for nucleate, nucleate. So it is also resultate subgroup, group, amizide subgroup. Uh, it is really not very easy to discriminate between these structures by XRD pattern, because all these structures, like resultate subgroup, have really nice peak at seven angstroms. This is distance between these two layers. All of them have nice peak at 353 or 356, which is distance between two uh, nearest uh, silica, uh, silicon four plus cations. And the whole shape of the form of this spectrum should be really very similar to, but however, it is really good luck for us in good fortune that these samples are very widely studied. These structures are widely studied by geochemists because amazites and other uh, phyllosilicates are wide, widely um, very common minerals in, um, which can be found anywhere. The phase, um, phase evolution of the sample during argon treatment shows that, first of all, we'd like to say that uh, this peak at 270 degrees C has no um, relation to amnesite structure. That is the composition of ammonia carbonate, which formed also during our hydro treatment, in our hydrothermal conditions. It was proved by FTIR, by analysis of evolving gases. So that is not amnesite decomposition really. And then we have three steps of uh, weight change. Uh, first two, um, effects do not in, are not accompanied by any change in infrared spectrum nor in XRD pattern and they should be attributed to removal of water from inter-sheet distance, inter-layer space of uh, clay structure. However, at last treatment of 655 or 650 degrees C, uh, we can see that the shape of FTIR spectra changed also electron spectroscopy spectra changes and also uh, XRD pattern changes a little bit. The most important changes can be seen here in FTIR pattern. This is typical amazite FTIR uh, spectrum and here we can see that it approaches to a very different um, shape of spectrum and that is characteristic for TOT again structure which I'll show you later for chloride, so-called chloride mineral. And it is important for electron spectrum that the positions of nickel to plus uh, transitions are just the same as if they were, but however forbidden transition uh, to 23,000 and 13,000 became more intense probably due to change, change in the uh, symmetry of tetrahedral coordination of nickel to plus. However, you can see that also white band above 30,000 precipital centimeters appears, which is related to the uh, charge transfer band of uh, nickel O nickel. It only was only small one uh, band of charge transfer nickel O nickel uh, before. That means that nickel cations were uh, spread uh, through entire sample before this treatment and after this treatment they um, are more concentrated and form something like nickel oxide clusters. 
And therefore, we suppose that there is really polymorphous transformation of enzyme, which was accompanied also by uh, escape of some water, uh, which gave chloride structure. Chloride structure is TOT brucite interchange of sheets. So we have interchange of sheets of TOT, like in skin inside, and brucite sheets. And to form from this structure, this structure, it is necessary just to rotate or inverse this tetrahedron layer to this phase, and after that, this layer of octahedrons will be released into separate brucite like sheet. And also, uh, the fact that nickel cations had no joint cluster before, and they were spread all around the sample, and now they have some uh, cluster. That is, that means that here we have really not what I have shown here, nickel, magnesium, nickel, magnesium, nickel, but like nickel, nickel, magnesium, nickel, nickel. So I'm not really very correct in this um, scheme. So we suppose now that uh, most of nickel are concentrated in precise sheets, and then really this structure can be easily reduced like uh, from nickel could be easily reduced from this brucite sheet and do not affect this TOT sheet of uh, uh, silicon uh, alum sil alumina silicate. And really during reduction we can see that we can reduce 95% of nickel as, as it was proved by oxygen titration and also follows from the exchange uh, of weight in hydrogen flow, and it happens at approximately 60, 600 degrees C. So, so it turns to some new mineral which has made very good and it is just UT silicate without any brucite sheet and zero nickel. And these samples could contain up to 20% of nickel. Probably we can prepare a more concentrated catalyst, but we didn't try. We were just obtained about 20% that is enough. Uh, with a uh, size of metallic particles of approximately 10 to 20 uh, to 12 nanometers, and surface area of nickel of 9 to 11 square meter per gram. However, it is really very important to be sure that we have no silica in our samples after uh, hydrogenation and also after reaction. Of course, we have tried this FTIR patterns uh, to see if there is any silica, and we could see no this uh, band at 1200 reciprocal centimeters, but that is not enough sensitive. However, XPS was found to be really sensitive to the cationic composition of mixed oxide. Uh, if we have pure silica, the position of C2P and O1S are two, two, two electron volts higher, and here it's one and a half electron volts higher, then the position of C2P and O1S in a silicon aluminum containing mixed oxide. And you can see that initial sample after calcination, after reduction, and after uh, treating in steam within reforming conditions of 20 bars, are all of them have the same binding energy of 101.8 electron volts for C2P, and there is no even small shoulder in the region of what it could be expected for silica. The same could be said about O1S, and um, that definitely means that we have no significant uh, amount of silica present in our samples. We suppose that we have no more than 1% of silica with respect to silica, entire silicon content in our samples. So we, we conclude that nickel magnesium anisite derived catalysts are stable up to 850 degrees C because this reduction was performed at 850 degrees C. The structure of active component of nickel magnesium on the derived catalyst, we started to um, study from hydrogen thermal desorption data and XRV data. Here are the estimations of the mean particle size, or better to say the coherent 
domain scattering domain um, from XRV broadening. You can see well here that we have from 11 to 15 nanometers from XRV, and that is our some reference sample of nickel magnesium oxide catalyst, which will be used further in the analytic studies. And you see that hydrogen thermal desorption data give very similar dispersion data. So these data are really very similar, and we should consider that they are really very close for these two data sets. So we could suppose that there is no declaration of samples, and these samples are really accessible to hydrogen molecules. However, the data on oxygen absorption were really shocking for us. For nickel magnesium oxide, it's OK. Again, we have satisfactory agreement between these two figures. However, for all amazides, we can see that absorption capacity with respect to oxygen is really miserable. It's only 0.1, 0.2, when it should be 2, according to literature data. So only 10% of, of our surface could really absorb oxygen. It should not be really metallic surface. However, it could absorb and reverse the absorb and activate hydrogen. This XPS data on the structure of the active component of nickel magnesium mosaic derived catalyst showed that really we have only nickel 2 plus for the reduced sample and after seeing the thing reforming, just like we had for initial catalyst and for calcite catalyst. We have only small shoulder in the area where we should have binding energy or for nickel zero. However, we can see that nickel to silicon ratio dropped down during reduction. Just as if we concentrated all nickel somewhere apart from the surface. And during arc and sputtering of the sample for five minutes, nickel to plus absolutely disappeared and we have really nice peak of nickel zero. And again, nickel to silicon ratio went again up to 15. And that means probably that the metallic nickel particles are covered by some nickel containing oxide layer, which should be two four nanometers in um, uh, th thickness, because the depth of sensitivity of uh, XPS is approximately two nanometers and the um, rate of argon sputtering is approximately one nanometer per minute. So it looks like, of course, it's necessary to note here that uh, XPS, uh, uh, XPS beam itself could reduce, uh, well, spo argon sputtering itself could reduce nickel to plus cations. It is well known that uh, argon beam could, be, uh, it is just dependent on the we, uh, on the extent of stabilization of nickel to plus in oxide. For example, uh, argon plus sputtering easily reduces normal nickel oxide, but it cannot reduce nickel hydroxide. And these are TEM data of the same sample. First of all, I would like to show you this sample. You can see that there is real layered structure of sheets. This is some profile uh, sheet image. This is some phase sheet images. And you can see that there are some nickel particles, metallic nickel particles, really, which are scattered along, around this uh, sample on the surface. This size is approximately 5 to 7 nanometers, so it is a little bit less than it was um, observed by XRD. And here is some uh, high resolution image, and probably that is somehow over magnified this. Uh, micrograph and the screen, but you can see that here there is some crystal structure of nickel, and these are uh, the spacing of approximately two angstrom, like for nickel zero, and these are hexagonal structure of support, uh, which has spacing of approximately 3.6 angstroms, like it should be for silicon uh, hexagonal coordinated, well, hexagonal symmetry silicon layer. But also what can be seen from this slide is that these metallic particles B are decorated by some amorphous layer of amorphous oxide and no crystal structure can be found.
found in these layers. No for this, neither for this particle, nor for any other of particles on this layer. So there is something like shape uh, around this particle, which uh, has no evident crystal structure. So it looks like a bit, uh, yes, and thickness of this layer is approximately two nanometers, just like we had found from XPS. So it looks like these data uh, are in agreement with XPS and are in agreement certainly with oxygen absorption because if we have oxide layer on the surface of metallic particle, it is not possible to absorb oxygen anymore. However, they are somehow conflict in conflict with hydrogen thermal desorption data because these particles seem to activate dehydrogen, adsorb hydrogen, and reversibly adsorb hydrogen. It could be desorbed during thermal desorption. And what's more, we have found that our catalysts, so nickel amazides, are rather active in steamy finger form. These are turnover frequency uh, with respect to the amount of molecules of methane converted per um, one surface nickel atom per second uh, with respect to, in relation to one bar pressure of methane. These are data for our amazides. These are three points for our nickel magnesium oxide catalyst. And these are reference data from Rostrup Nielsen for nickel aluminum catalyst, aluminum catalyst. And you can see that activities of our catalyst are somehow two to five times lower than for reported in literature catalyst. However, our activation energy are also lower than it was reported by Rostrup Nielsen. He reported 110 kilojoule per mole. And uh, Badalov Tionkin reported 100. 30 kilojoule per mole. Therefore, we should um, conclude that our uh, tests were performed in somehow uh, <coughs> intermediate range where uh, intraparticle diffusion affected our activity. So we should suppose that the real activity of our catalysts are somewhat higher, and uh, our data, of course, cannot be used for some kinetics on numerical kinetics, but they can be used for just comparison of activities of our samples, and we should conclude that amazide-derived derived catalysts show activity which is comparable to that of nickel magnesium oxide catalysts. So we have to make a conclusion that this nickel metallic nickel core uh, oxide shell particles are active in methane oxidation process by water molecules. Now I would like to go to uh, catalytic reactions in methane decomposition. We performed methane decomposition in two regimes, first in temperature programmed regime and first in uh, um, constant temperature regime. In temperature programmed regime, that is a typical shape of curve, that is the DPG signal, so the rate of weight change, the weight of carbon accumulation over nickel magnesium, magnesium catalyst. So we can see that we can distinguish four different ranges. First, we have uh, some low activity and increase of activity, or probably exponential increase of activity with temperature. Then we have some uh, region where uh, uh, rate of reaction growth with temperature. Then we have some deactivation. Uh, region where activity drops down up down to zero and then again activity starts to gain with temperature. And also we can see that on our way back here we our profile is just the same. We have no deactivation in this range, but here we have no activity as well. That is the how weight changes. Here the sample was approximately uh, ten milligrams so we gave more than 1,400% of weight. That is the same uh, curve, but in Arrhenius coordinates. You can see that is for nickel magnesium oxide, that is for nickel amazide. That is our sensitivity threshold, and that is illustration that gas phase reaction should not be accounted 
we should not account for this weak gain because gas phase reaction rate uh, is over more than one order of magnitude lower for in our experimental conditions than what we observed. And this gas phase uh, is rate is lower than our sensitivity threshold. According to Kipperman, more better to say according to Zeldovich, and later it was uh, summarized in the monograph of Kipperman, uh, this uh, curve should be considered in terms of increasing the uh, mass transfer limitations due to increase of carbon forms in the uh, catalyst. And so we have first some kinetic region here where no acti activity is not limited by diffusion constraints, then internal diffusion control region, deactivation due to spatial limitations, and then external kinetic region. What does it mean, external kinetic region? That means that catalyst is a dense pellet which is not permeable by gas at all. So diffusion constraints are really very severe. But however, we have a miserable part, very small part of active sites on the external geometric surface of the catalyst, which behave themselves like in kinetic region, because they don't have any uh, diffusion limitations. They are few, but they behave like in kinetic region. And what is what we would like to say here that really we have uh, some exponential, some linear part here with ex, uh, effective energy of approximately 90 kilojoule per mole. And here we have a running flow with, uh, well, observed any activation energy of approximately 190 kilojoule per mole. That fits well, matches well that in the internal diffusion region for the first order reaction, we should have one half of an activation energy for external kinetic region or for kinetic region. So it fits well this model. And also activation energy, which we measure here, match well the data, the literature data on affinity composition, is, which is approximately 200 kilojoule per mole, in, which was reported by David Train in 77. We also have to note here that this value is much higher than the process of carbon diffusion through the metallic particle. And therefore, we should conclude that methane decomposition is limited by the surface process, probably CH bond cleavage, like it earlier was supposed by Trim and recently by uh, Japanese scientists, according to uh, deuterium hydrogen isotope exchange process studies. Okay, and uh, therefore uh, we have we know some activation energy, and it is the same for all the samples, for all three our nickel amazite derived samples of one nickel magnesium catalyst, and so we can try to measure the activity of these samples in some uh, at some constant temperature, and try to make some conclusions about the activity or mm, some pre-exponent of these reactions. And we can't compare activity because mechanism is really the same, could be that the same, the activation energy of us is the same for all these three samples and reference sample of nickel magnesium oxide. So. At uh, constant temperature, we treated our samples of uh, reduced it and lowered temperature to uh, approximately 790 uh, K. Then we fed our methane, uh, pure methane, and we had three regions. First, increasing CH4 concentration, uh, or, well, increasing weight uh, gain rate is probably to increasing methane concentration because we had some uh, trying column before our reactor, and there should be some time to mix up together in this uh, space and also in our reaction chamber. Then we have some. Uh, region of constant activity, and then we have the activation. And we suppose that uh, here we can use this data as some estimation for uh, activity of the sample in some kinetic region. Of course, it is not pure kinetic region, but we can use it as an estimate. 
And these are data on some kinetic constant pre exponent factors for nickel magnesium oxide catalysts and for nickel endozytes. First of all, I'm letting you know that we have for nickel magnesium oxide pre exponent is about 10 power 13 recipro reciprocal seconds. So that really is what should be expected for uh, monomolecular limiting stage of CH bond cleavage on the surface of the uh, catalyst. For nickel endozytes, we can see that activities are more than one order of magnitude less than for nickel magnesium oxide, and carbon capacity during this test, during total desactivation of catalyst, is also 10 times less. And these are electron microscopy data of uh, two samples after methane decomposition. That is nickel magnesium oxide, that is nickel magnesium derived catalyst. You can see that nickel magnesium oxide is just a, a lot of uh, fiber, nanofibers, and we can see even no catalyst here because all this thing it is just dense, well, uh, dense. Dense pieces of nanofibers. I don't know how to say. And for nickel magnesium derived catalyst, also after after methane decomposition, of course we can't see nanofibers here and here, but they are really few. Only few of them are present here, and these are high resolution data. Well, that is just typical nanofiber in nickel magnesium oxide. Well. What is usually reported in this fish bone in the fiber. And here you can see that nickel amizide derived catalyst, the, the surface is really clean. In this range, what we selected for this presentation, there are no carbon formation at all. So amizide derived catalysts of the methane decomposition are really clean. However, they are few nanofibers, and these are uh, some examples of nanofibers from nickel amizide derived catalyst here. And here, even we, we managed to see some particle uh, with growing nanofiber. And we can see that the structure of nanofibers is just the same fish bone, nothing really very strange or really very different from usual uh, nanofibers which formed in, within the composition over nickel. And the shape of particles, which are active in nanofiber formation, is well faceted. And again, we can see nothing very special. So those nanofibers or filaments are really very um, usual. And probably the nickel, which is active in this process of filament formation for amazide derived uh, catalysts, is just normal nickel particles, some small admixtures of normal nickel particles which is not bound to the nickel uh, to the silicate surface. And if you have a look at those particles which are not active in uh, carbon formation process, you can see that really all of them, and this figure is really very representative, all of them have some shells of oxide around them here. And here you can see that inside there are really normal nickel particles. And also we can see that there is no carbon formed at the surface of these particles or at the surface of the shell. Because you can see here there are some traces of uh, filament which went through this sample. But so we should see something similar near these particles. But in the ne nearest surrounding of metallic nickel particles, there is no carbon at all. Okay, so most of nickel particles in nickel amazide catalysts are inactive and comprise, again, metallic core and amorphous oxide shell. And these are data for zero disproportionation. Again, we used the temperature programmed regime of reaction, and this is a little bit different shape of uh, curve of DVG signal versus temperature versus time. And um, I don't want to go now in details why this shape is so 
different from methane decomposition. However, I would like to show you that nickel amnesides have 10 times less activity with respect to nickel magnesium oxide again in this process. And this is some summary. So we have data of nickel zero dispersion from XRD blind protein and hydrogen thermal dissolution, which almost coincide for all the samples. However, for oxygen absorption, we have some good well, match for nickel magnesium oxide, but absolutely a huge difference for amnesides, amnesides derived catalysts. And for catalytic activity data, it looks like we have uh, reasonable activity of amnesides in steam methane reforming, but absolutely, well, but low activity of the same amnesides in carbon formation reactions. And of course, well, it is quite reasonable to suppose that these metallic core and oxide shell particles are active in steam methane reforming and are not active in carbon formation processes. So, I would like to make some, once again, some more conclusions. First of all, nickel magnesium oxides, amazides, and nickel magnesium chlorides, vermiculites, it is possible to prepare them that they will not contain silica and they will be stable up to 850 degrees C in argon and hydrogen and also up to 650 degrees C at 20 bar and steam thin reforming mixture. After the reduction, nickel forms the particles which are the metallic core and amorphous layer shell. shell. And the shell contains nickel 2 plus cations and most probably silicon 4 plus and aluminum 3 plus cations as well because they are not reduced at 650 degrees C in hydrogen. And also, so they are very stable. So metallic core oxide shell particles are supported on the crystalline pure aluminum silicate and they are well dispersed and they are able to activate the hydrogen however they are not able to absorb oxygen they are really high active in steam methane reforming and they are not active in carbon formation reactions and so we suppose that these particles or this catalyst could be really promising and prospective for the industrial application and also they have really good rheology to form really sophisticated shape of catalysts like these phenops which was really the final goal of this native project. Well, thank you very much and I would like to answer a question of the Very interesting talk, and uh, we're also very interested in, in understanding the, the metal support interaction, and uh, sort of trying to draw analogies with like our cobalt and aluminum catalyst for Fisher tropes. And usually, what we see is when we conduct a temperature program reduction, is when we have a small loading of, of say, cobalt. Uh, in, in an alumina supporting catalyst, there's usually a broad reduction profile due to this metal support interaction. And then there's usually reported a peak that's a very, very high temperature above, like 1,000 K, which uh, is always attributed to a little bit of cobalt aluminate, which is... Uh, which what is temperature then? Above 1,000 K. 1,000, yes. Okay. So it, it seems to me that what you're act actually doing here is you're forming a, a bulk compound and uh, probably the bulk is irreducible, I would think, under these conditions. But the fact that you've cre uh, basically created so much surface, it allows you to then be able to reduce the components on the surface uh, like because it's a higher energy state, because it takes energy to, to create a surface. Is that basically what you're doing? Uh, I think yes. Uh, that is really right uh, what, you are, what you have said. 
because really that is there is really some bulk compounds and really it has really high energy or surface energy because really that is also somehow the surface there is water inside in this uh, gap water could be placed inside in this gap cations could be introduced in this gap like so called fever place yes and so of course this uh, sample has really high surface energy but however it is somehow uh, May, makes no work because there are OH bonds and here is oxygen bonds, so there is some uh, hydrogen, hydrogen uh, water also. Just well, it, lo it, it works like um, surface active compound uh, with low surface energy, specific surface energy. But when we are forming this structure, we have really very finely dispersed, really nickel hydroxide on the surface of some really well-developed support. And that is why we can reduce this nickel, despite it is really uh, hardly, hard to be reduced. In, otherwise, it will be not such a well-developed surface of this structure. And, but we managed to do this only at 620 degrees C, so the really high, high temperature reduction. So um, I guess if you go several layers into the structure, mm -hmm. then you can probably find Ni2 plus that has not been reduced. Is that correct? Or I suppose that the, uh, well, we try to titrate our samples after reduction by hydrogen, or by oxygen. Yes. And uh, that was dry air, synthetic, no, dry air, not synthetic, but normal dry air. And what we have found that the weight gain was uh, approximately 95% uh, corresponded to 95% of the class reduction. Uh, also, we made it by titration from by uh, N2O with high temperatures. So also, we just after we uh, made our oxygen absorption experiments, so uh, 50 degrees C, uh, we me measured it by oxygen absorbed on nickel surface. After that, we raise temperature higher to 150, 200 degrees C. And after that, we again see consumption of oxygen. And, uh, the entire amount of oxygen consumed was just uh, the amount of nickel zero we had. And it was again approximately 95%. Well, for some samples, we had 90, but for those which I present here, it was 95. So it looks like almost all nickel is reduced. However, we can see that some nickel is not reduced, and it is more mainly on the, on the oxide shell of this part of the cell. When you have the images, you see the the metallic core, mm -hmm. and then you see the shell, mm -hmm. the oxide shell, you call it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And, and you just compare the, the size of it, the, the metallic core mm -hmm. is almost, well, not much wider than the, the, sh the you know. The almost the same size. Yes, yes. almost the same, but just a little bigger maybe. <clears throat> but yes. what I was wondering is, when you change your preparation conditions, have you observed if or not you actually get a different ratio of core to shell size, and mm -hmm. if so, what would possibly be the parameters that you you know would have to change? Have you done that? Have you looked at that? And if, if so, how can you relate that possibly to the activity? Uh, and does the, the activity change with the aspect ratio change? You know, for emesites, for emesites, uh, for so for nickel aluminum magnesium, few uh, aluminous nickels for this, we had made uh, these studies only uh, using these. Uh, two or no three samples, uh, and uh, we have seen that all of them have really thick uh, oxide core or oxide shell, really thick, comparable to the size of the core. But what was different? It was really different for uh, the slipweed sample. I didn't show it. Uh, well, For this sample, 
we have seen that this shell was really really thin, thin, not thin, but it was like island on the particle. It doesn't cover the entire particle. And this sample was much more active in carbon formation processes. And in carbon for after uh, carbon formation from within the uh, decomposition, the samples looked like we had a particle. It was still on support. It did not. It did not um, generated filament. But around these particles, there were one or two layers of carbon formed. So they are covered by uh, carbon well, one, two. Sometimes they were not full layers, but also some islands of one, two layers of carbon, well, graphitic layers. So that looked like uh, these samples had some free surface uh, of nickel, and so they are, were able to form uh, carbon, but they were not able to form the graphite-like phase, probably because their surface was partially covered with this oxide, and so there were special um, restrictions on formation of nuclei of uh, crystal. So because it's uh, necessary to have some uh, uh, nuclei for crystallization of new uh, crystal for carbon phase formation, and there was no chance to do that. So they really generated some uh, carbon from the film, but they could not form uh, filament. That's what we have seen without alumina. But with alumina, it looked like all samples of endozyes which we studied were very similar. They actually they differed only by the amount of nickel which were introduced in these three samples. Um, uh, I was just wondering if, if you had looked at. Uh, temperature program reduction of the catalyst, and also if you had looked at quantifying the carbon using like temperature program oxidation, maybe um, would be temperature program reduction after carbon, uh, from the, uh, after after methane reduction, or uh, after the methane decomposition. So what I was thinking about was on the spent on the used catalyst, had, had, you, had you looked at uh, temperature program oxidation to quantify the amount of carbon? carbon. No, no, probably we should do that because we didn't do, do, do this. Because, well, first, uh, it was for, for nickel magnesium, for example, let's say, we have more than 14 times increasing the uh, sample weight. So it was in really no sense to uh, try to quantify amount of carbon from uh, oxidation. But for amizides, it would really be interesting. So we should do this. No, we didn't. I was just wondering about the utility of your catalyst after reduction, because as you're, I'm sure you're aware, nickel saponites and um, mm -hmm. synthetic nickel or micas have been widely studied for hydrocracking applications. Your samples are presumably much less acidic. Have you looked at that? No. We should look. <laughs> we did it, yes. You know, yes, probably it is, will, will be interesting. Uh, I didn't suppose that uh, uh, acidic sites will be really important in this process, so I didn't look at this. But of course, it could be interesting to compare with synthetic saponites. But it, it isn't really like saponite, you know. Uh, saponite is a little bit different because saponite is more deoctahedral clay, uh, and so aluminum is mostly located in octahedral positions and some of the hydro positions are vacant. And here it is should be straight stoichiometry one to one of aluminum octahedrons and aluminum tetrahedrons. But uh, surely uh, some uh, acid sites should be in this catalyst. Um, of course they should be. And of course it is interesting. Uh, you could go to the the uh, uh, the bar chart that you showed towards the end, mm -hmm. you're showing that the uh, uh, the uh, reforming reaction, the specific activity is uh, 
is comparable to the carbon farming activity for the... No, no, no. It was just... Um, it was... Yeah, it was just normalized. So nickel magnesium oxide activity was taken as unity. So it was normalized to activity of nickel magnesium oxide. Okay. Just for um, to have some okay. uh, idea how to compare because activity are very different, and uh, to compare them is better to normalize. To okay. So so the uh, to look at uh, the nickel uh, uh, magnesium oxide catalyst, mm -hmm. the methane decomposition mm -hmm. reaction. That basically produces carbon, right? Uh, it's, it's it's difficult to say which reaction produces carbon because in the reaction conditions you have methane, you have CO. There should be some equilibrium mm -hmm. of, of carbon species on the surface, and right. if you have not so much of water, you should definitely produce carbon. So if you have the methane decomposition and then the steam reforming reaction, if they are taking place on the same. Uh, Mm -hmm. Similar active sites, so that is a kind yes. of competitive reaction. Yes, and yes, and yes. if this material is is acidic, I think the methane decomposition mm -hmm. would be probably uh, it's quite uh, sensitive to that. Reaction. For for usual catalysts where we have metallic nickel yeah. active metallic nickel, this uh, size should be the same for uh, methane decomposition and methane steam steam methane reform. But for these catalysts like amazite derived catalyst. This active site, like metallic core, oxide uh, shell, it looks like it is a different active site, which is active in oxidation reactions. So, because we have some active oxygen on the surface of this particle, which could interact with methane molecule. But they are not able to activate methane without oxidation. So they are not active sites for uh, refined formation because they cannot activate methane molecule otherwise than to oxidizing it. So the data which you have here, that's after a certain time on stream, or this is a, just an initial activity data? Or? Yeah. So for steam methane reforming, it was after several hours, or five hours, approximately five hours on stream in the uh, radiant reactor. And for CO disproportionation, these are data from temperature programs regime, so there was no steady state. And for methane decomposition, these are uh, data on initial activity. Okay, so different. because the deactivation is really very fast, so this activity in the starting point before the deactivation becomes due to diffusion constraints becomes really important. Well, let's thank the speaker again. Yeah. <laughs>